Got a game hunter in the family and not quite sure how to cook all the meat that he or she brings home? Leave it to Kate Krakowski Gooding to teach you 50 ways to eat a beaver in her book, 50 Ways to Eat a Beaver. In this episode, she'll teach us how to acquire game meats, how to handle them before cooking, and which other meats make a good substitute. Plus, we'll discuss her other books on cooking wild meat and her appearance on Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmern, coming up next on the Nutrition Heretic Podcast. So I'm sure you've heard that as you age, it gets harder to lose weight. Well, that's total bull because my friends, Laura and Veronica Chow's, they can prove it. They're a mother-daughter duo, and they've lost 125 pounds between the two of them at ages 50 and 20. And they've kept it off for over two years without starvation, deprivation, or hunger. So now you can learn their system and a whole lot more with a free 10-day trial to their online membership They'll give you the diet, the recipes, classes, and more. Sign up today at nutritionheretic.com forward slash utmost diet. Fat is bad for you. I just pop a pill and I'm fine. Meat is murder. It's time for bad food punishment. It's time for real nourishment. It's time for the Nutrition Heretic. The following program is provided as information only and may not be construed as medical or health advice. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease. No action or inaction should be taken solely on the basis of the information provided here. Please consult with a licensed healthcare professional or doctor on any matter relating to your health and well being. And aloha, everybody. This is Adrian, the Nutrition Heretic, coming from the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, today, we're going to talk about wild meat uh, because years ago, my husband had this friend who used to like to go out hunting and he was really trying to connect with his roots. So, um, he went out and he caught a squirrel and he, we were playing poker one night and he's got the squirrel just cooking away on the stove. So I asked for a, a piece and it was tough, stringy and dry. Uh, and, and absolutely flavorless because he boiled the heck out of it. Uh, no salt, no seasoning, nothing. It was just a, a hunk of <laughs> tough boiled meat. Uh, you know, and I said, this has gotta be, this has gotta be a learning curve for, for this kind of meat because we don't have that anymore. You can't go to the store and just buy squirrel. There's no, there's no cookbooks about it. Uh, we do know that the founding fathers ate some of, uh, these wild, uh, meats like, like squirrel, um, and cock, by the way. Um, but, uh, a few years ago, my, um, good, uh, a marketing friend of mine, um, Ed, he went to a book signing in Maine, and he met today's guest heretic, which is Kate Krakowski Gooding, and she is the author of 50 Ways to Eat a Beaver. And I'd like to say that we are kindred spirits in our sense of humor, <laughs> at least. Kate, welcome <laughs> to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. I like your squirrel story. What an introduction. Yeah, um, I was kind of like sworn off of, uh, you know, it, it scared me away, maybe is a better way of saying it, from ever trying wild game meats. Um, not that I haven't had things like you say kangaroo, like, you know, I had the opportunity to eat certain things and they were done really well, you know, different uh, kinds of elk and moose and, and so on. But um What's how actually, first of all, how closely related are the squirrel and the beaver when it comes to meat quality? Not anywhere near. Really? There's no relation. So a squirrel, if it's typically, if it's cooked, it is, well, you shouldn't boil it. It should be braised and right. it ends up tasting like dark chicken. Ooh. Okay. Yes. It's delicious. It's just like, it's just like dark chicken meat. However... If you 
that's part of the reason why I started writing cookbooks because I got tired of people saying I've never had a good game meal. And it really is on how you prepare the meat as well as how it's taken care of from when you get it in the woods to your table. Right. So um, is, is there a period of aging or anything like that that people want to observe? Not, or is it not just a fresh meat? Well, for... For beaver and squirrel, the fresher, the better. Okay. There are some meats that it's important for it to hang, you know, a lot of red meats. However, that said, um, beaver, I, it, I usually get it. My brother catches it, traps it, puts it right away in the freezer. Okay. And unless you're going to eat it right away. Uh, squirrel, same thing. But like moose and elk and caribou and deer, there needs to be a little bit of hanging okay. for, you know, the blood to settle out. Right, right. And I know with chickens, we usually want to wait 24 hours for, um, I guess. After they've been bled, yes. Yeah. So, and there's nothing like that with the, the beaver or the, or the squirrel? No. Okay. Wow. That's awesome. Yes. And the beaver is red meat. Where right. the squirrel is like dark white meat. Right. Okay. All right. So now when you first had beaver, tell us a little bit about that story. Like what was, what was your introduction? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the book. So but... <laughs> I was, it's, it's actually really funny because I had gone trapping with my old boyfriend, Dwayne from up home in Jackman and unbeknownst to me he said to his mom you know why don't you make some beaver for dinner and we come back you know we'll have it isn't that so we suggestive went out <laughs> yeah <laughs> mom make some beaver for my new girlfriend yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> you know that's why my husband he he create he's the one that picked up the name of the book you know oh. the old double entendre right it's a good marketing thing <laughs> right. it does work i have to we say came back from Yes, it does, as yours does. <laughs> <laughs> so we came back from trapping and, you know, she had made this wonderful barbecued beaver over egg noodles. Mm. And it was so delicious that I said, I have to taste this meat by itself. Right. And I actually haven't gone back. The beaver and bear are probably my two favorite red meats. If really? I'm going to eat red wow. Meat. Yes. It's such a sweet red meat and all the, you know, part of it is the bear and the beaver. Most of the fat is between the pelt and the muscle. Okay. Gotcha. So it's very, very lean. Right. Very. It's still, and it, you know, it's, it's delicious. I love it. And so when I first met my husband and we were living together and then we got married. It was three years after we got married before I even told him I had beaver back straps because I wasn't getting a lot of beaver at the time. Right. And so I wasn't sharing them. So that's a, he's like, Oh, where did you get these? And I said, well, I've been getting them. <laughs> <laughs> but the beaver back straps are amazing. Also. I mean, I love all the different parts of the beaver except the tail. I'm not a tail fan. What's what's different about the tail? Well, if you like pork rinds and you like the fat and beans, then you will love it. I did make a recipe gotcha. for it in my in yes. my Yes, and I saw that reference, but I did, it didn't dawn I, on me that that's what you meant. Okay. Yeah, I don't. You know, I'm not. I'm not a fan of it. Um, if I'm gonna, I just made pork rinds last beaver, night, so, <laughs> so it might just oh, be up did, my alley. Okay, well, then you might. You might like it. <laughs> but if you're gonna, if I'm gonna cook the whole beaver, I will braise the whole thing because there's not a lot of meat around the shoulders and the back. Right. It's just the back. So typically, my brother will trap and just save me the legs and the back straps. And the biggest beaver he got last year for me, I have a picture of him. He is it's sixty nine inches long or sixty eight inches long. Yes. It was, it's a super blanket. It was huge. Oh and I forget gosh. how much you said it weighed. 40 I didn't know pounds. got that big. Jeez, it was big. It's enormous. Yes. It's bigger than yeah. me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they are huge and they are not an animal you want to upset. Right. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, they, they're nasty. They could be, na- they'll be, well, if you're out in a canoe and they're, and you're near anywhere near and they're breeding or they're preparing, uh, for the winter, you know, they will just slap their tail. It's like you're in my territory. Whoa. So what, what other meat, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with this, part, <laughs> but what other okay. meat would you, would you, um, equate it to, or, or, you know, what, because I guess what I'm thinking is that modern Americans, we tend to, because, and we'll go into this later, but because we, you know, have these more neutral tasting meats as our, our primary meats, right? So the mm-hmm. the beef, pork, and chicken, right? They're fairly neutral. Wild, um, right. You know, going into, like, I grew up eating lamb and mm-hmm. goat. And first of all, most Americans have, until recently, had never heard of eating goat. Uh, but lamb was always like, oh, it's too gamey. It's, you know, I don't like uh, the fat, the whatever people have, you know, issues with. Where would you say the beaver f- in terms of flavor? For that, up? it's not the same flavor as lamb, but I would say it's a heightened flavor. And because typically we are used to eating pork, chicken, and beef that are farm raised, right. you are not, the, the difference in the meat flavor is because of what they're eating and where they are and where they are within um, like the grazing, if they're cattle grazing out on the plain and then finish corn fed, that's going to be different than ones that are just corn grain fed all the time. Right. And the, your animals are out in the woods, you know, they're eating all your fresh leaves and berries and roots. And so they are, which is all very flavorful. Right. And what, and you know, and the typical animal that we eat is bland food. So we're used to eating bland meat. Right. And that, I'm glad that you brought that up because, um, you know, I have had the opportunity to eat chicken that has been more, you know, foraged, uh, as well as pigs that are, uh, given more variety in their rations. Um, for example, in Northern Italy, they eat a lot of chestnuts around November time. Um, so you get that infusion into the meat, uh, which, you know, makes a very different profile, uh, of flavor. Um, don't know that I've had, uh, beef that has gotten much more than just grass, uh, but I know for you know several of the other animals, we've definitely had more variety, and you can taste that. There's a big difference, and one of the things I actually had stopped eating red meat for probably 30 years. Oh wow! Be- because unless, only if it was game, because the difference in the color, oh. it was like pale, pale mm-hmm. red in comparison to wild game meat, which is red, rich red. Right. I mean, it was just such a difference. And I couldn't, and I don't like taking into anything that, you know, why eat it if it's not going to taste good? And they got to the point where I'm not sure what the different hormones that they inject or are fed, but it just didn't, you know, it didn't sit well. So people, you will look at the statistics and, I mean, I don't know if you understand that Maine is leading the top as far as young farmers in agriculture. That's awesome. Yeah, in the United States. I can see that. I can see a lot mm -hmm. of people moving to Maine as refuge. (laughs) Just like (laughs) how they moved to Hawaii for refuge. (laughs) Exactly. We're how life should be, right? And the flavor, you know, like we're part of a CSA where we get chicken every other week, fresh chicken. So we have them throughout the winter. And the difference in flavor and when I make my stocks, you know, it's it's 100% difference from, you know, your organic versus your your things that you can buy at some stores. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, we just uh, we're recording this right after Thanksgiving. And uh, yeah, you know, people came over on Thanksgiving and they're like, wow, how'd you make that? And I was like, fresh ingredients. Like, you know, <laughs> what's, what's your point? You know, um, it's not that hard uh, to make a good tasting meal when you start out with great ingredients. I mean, that's, that's the backbone of it and you don't have to mask it over. And actually, actually that's one of the things I like about your recipes is that they are recipes that enhance flavor or complement 
the flavor. Um, it, it's very clear that you're not trying to cover up the flavor of the meat, which right. I think is really, really important. For people and to I will meat. support you 100% because I cannot tell people enough what you had just said is that it is so important to start with basic fresh ingredients. And sometimes just using fresh, uh, one fresh herb as opposed to dried makes right. all the difference in the world. Right. Exactly. And I mean, I, you know, it's, um, I think two, two flavors in the kitchen that are overlooked, uh, because they're considered too plain are, uh, well, in desserts, it would be vanilla bean. Mm -hmm. And in regular cooking it would be parsley. A, yes, parsley a little is bit of parsley luck. added at the end of any dish. Like even my salads, people are like, what is that fabulous flavor? I'm like, it's parsley. That's all it is. It's just, <laughs> just a little, you know, just a couple of sprigs of parsley chopped up at the end. Um, totally con con uh, changes the profile of this, of any salad. Yes. And you're, it's so funny because my two basics that I go for are fresh, long leaf thyme. Mm, yeah. French, sorry, not fresh, French long leaf thyme, which I really like. It's the most flavorful for me and cardamom. Ah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that those are, are two good ones, but I think, you know, at that point you're, I don't want to say you're getting complicated, but I've had to explain to people what time is <laughs> not to mention and cardamom isn't even in most people's vocabulary. Right? No, right. Actually, you're absolutely right. Because if, the, if they've grown up with a meat, a meat potatoes culture, Salt and pepper is almost all they've known. Right, right, and then the, and, you know that's kind of where the parsley and the vanilla come in. It's like those are those are exotic, but they're also considered plain. You know, like people think, oh, what flavor of ice cream? And they're always surprised if a child says vanilla instead of chocolate or strawberry, right? Because right. vanilla, it's so you know, we even use it as as kind of a, a pejorative <laughs> meaning. You know, that something is bland or boring, right? Right. Um, so, so how did you start writing cookbooks? So I was, I had just, uh, quit my husband's company. Mm -hmm. Um, I had actually turned it around for him financially and I'm not in the maintenance mode. So <laughs> I started doing some consulting and we were living up on Mount Desert Island at the time. And a friend asked me to write a cookbook for her because she knows I've been cooking all my life. You know, I've totally self-taught. So I started putting some numbers and things together. And the bottom line is she wanted me to develop a tabletop cookbook oh. for 100% sales. And I said, well, that's not going to work. You know, I said, right. because you're going to need national distribution for what you want. And I don't have that networking capability, you know, up here on the island. Yeah. So I finished that and I said, you know what? I have signed up for this publishing, how to publish cookbook and wanted to delve into that a little bit more. And I, and I was like, you know, I, I've written and created cookbooks. I mean, written and created recipes all my life. You know, why don't I, I can do this. So back in 2006, I just started doing all my research. Um, and the hardest thing for me, getting all my recipes together, and it was a labor of, I don't know if I want to call it love or not, but <laughs> measuring. Yes. I, you know, I broke down recipes, but I didn't always put the measurements in. And it just exactly. was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I wrote mine, I had to like actually consult other cookbooks to get amounts because I know, you know, visually and, and uh, there are those differences, you know, even one thing I, I always talk about is salt uh, going from, for example, if you're using uh, Celtic sea salt to Himalayan salt, you're going to get a very, like Him Himalayan salt, I've found very difficult to be precise with how much flavor I'm going to get out of that salt. Uh, sometimes it seems undersalted and then it seems to go very quickly to oversalted. And the, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I don't know what it is about Himalayan salt. I don't have that problem with French sea salt for some reason. Yeah, um, it's salt. It's very strong. Himalayan salt is. It can be, but then I've, I've you know used it in recipes where I use the same amount that I would have used of another salt, and it just nothing. Buckus just doesn't taste like anything. Uh, well, it depends so, on what you're doing with it. So yes, I I do understand. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure, but one way or another, it always seems like I'm I'm 
never at the right amount for <laughs> for whatever I'm cooking. <laughs> I'm like either way under or way over. Um, oh, that that's frustrating. Yes, it, it's very frustrating. But um, it, but I guess where where I was going with this is just that um, you know, every cookbook it it uh is going to you know, it's a guideline, but it doesn't necessarily have to be written in stone. So you know, when people are making dishes, uh, to kind of use some of their intuition, and you know, if they want it a little bit. Uh, more salt and, and keeping in mind that salt, in my opinion, shouldn't make the food taste salty as much as it should bring out the flavors of the food. Right. Uh, it, you know, so I, I don't like to taste salt in my food. I just want it to support the hands. flavors. Right. Yeah. That are there. Um, so I, I totally feel you on the whole measurement. <laughs> yes. Right. And the one, yeah, the one thing that I had done right from the beginning was I put because I'm self-taught, there are so many things that I assume when yes. cooking that people know. And my husband was testing a recipe for me and I, you know, and my description was to make a flatbread. However, you needed to cover it with a damp cloth, you mm -hmm. know, to allow it to rise. Yes. So he calls me in for, for me to answer a question. And I look at this little lump on the sideboard and I go, what's that? He goes, Oh, it's the flatbread. And it was roll. It was tightly covered in this wet towel, damp towel. And I was, you know, so what needed to happen? I had to explain that it needs to go in a bowl, a grease bowl with the, you know, with the damp towel laid on top of it. But that's, you know, that's a prime example. Right. So I had testers for all of my cookbooks. Oh, good. Yeah, you know that's that's a that's a very good uh, point. I, I was actually just talking to my seven year old because uh, I teach a a cooking class at at her school, and every time I you know I I talk to the kids and I'm like, okay, this is what we're gonna do, and I explain it to them, but for some reason I can never explain it enough. You know, <laughs> there's always you know I say slice something, I get mash. You know, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, and it's like you show them, but then yeah, there's. You know, when people don't cook, I think there's there's um, a disconnect. This well, there's this miscon uh, misconception that that things are very much more difficult in the kitchen for one. Mm -hmm. And I and I notice people tend to like manhandle things more <laughs> if you don't right. give them and, really super specific direction. So, and have you noticed how they have a difficult time in how to slice properly where they're not taking off their knuckles. Yes, there, there's that. And there's also a, um, the, the sawing back and forth, which does <laughs> not come naturally to a lot of people. They think they're just going to like, like, you know, chop it down. Like it's a battle ax and then just remove it, you know, just, just separate it from the other part. But the, you know, it's, I have to explain all the time. Like you kind of saw, you know, like if you're carving particularly, you know, you're, you you want right. to kind of saw back and forth <laughs> on that. And then, of course, if you have a dull knife, that doesn't help. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the whole getting fingers under there. Yeah. <laughs> and things sliding around. Oh, no, let's make a flat surface out of that round thing before we try to cut into it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, um, what are some of, um, some of the health benefits as you see it, uh, between the wild meats and the store-bought meats? Well, the big thing for people to understand is that, you know, your wild game is a much better source of protein minerals, uh, such as iron and zinc because of what they eat. You know, they're out there eating a natural diet. They're more active than, a typical farm animal and this all of that between the the food they eat and their activity contributes to their lower fat content of the mm -hmm. meat so you know eating greens in the wild contributes to your pro inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids um, also a higher content of your anti-inflammatory omega-3 fat uh, fatty acids um, and that's including fish. I mean, you're going to go to a, say you go to the store and see, you'll see two different kinds of salmon. You'll see a sockeye and you'll see a farm raised. Right. The sockeye will typically be your nice, clear red through the whole way through. And then your farm raised, you're going to see in between each layer, this thick, like white. Yep. And that's, 
That, and that's the fat. It's like gelatinous, not even like good gelatinous. It's, no. it's it, I don't even call it fat. I call it grease. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not, not yeah, normal. It's not good. It's not normal. And it's orange in color. It is. Because so it's, yeah, you know it's, that whole story, right? How they, they're actually gray, the farm raised salmon, because they're in cages eating each other's feces as well as soy and corn pellets. Um, and that just before they used to feed them uh, shrimp shells before harvest, uh, but now apparently they just feed them dye. Oh, so they don't see that is news to me. Yeah, I know they had finished some shrimp, you know, the shrimp shells because that color right. turns their meat. Right. Right. Well, I've I've this is this is this was according to one of my butchers from gosh about fifteen years ago. Who told me this? So I don't know if things, if that, how accurate his information was, but I actually have had a few uh, other people in the fishing industry um, back that up and say that they're mostly using these, these dyes. Well, I will say that I'm curious because a friend of mine caught me a wild, a farm raised salmon after. At, they had got must have gotten out of the pens. Yeah, there was that big scare. When they were closing on the down West Coast recently, and it was you know it was pink. So I don't know if it was at the end where you know it had eaten shells or been eaten dyed. But that's curious. I'm going to do some research on that. Thank yeah. you for that. Well, well, actually, that that'll be interesting too um, because I know that there's there, there was that big uh, breakout of all the fish in the Pacific Northwest uh, a couple months back. Um, yes, but. Uh, I was going to say the, um, yeah, the, the color, was it pink or was it orange? And like, I wonder how, how, you know, how much time it had spent out of the pen. Yeah, no, it was, it wasn't orange like a sockeye, but it wasn't a lighter pink orange like they usually are, the farm raised one. It was a little bit darker than that. So it maybe Hello. was out for a little while. So perhaps the fish had gotten out of the pen and was out in the wild for a little bit because the color was really good on that. You know, one of the things that people always ask me too is about mussels because there's so many that are cultivated now. But the difference between that is they're not penned up. Right. You know, they are, they're hanging on ropes and there is stuff going through that they're able to capture and eat. And so the flavor is still good for the cultivated mussels versus you know, ones that you can dig. They're both really good. However, the cultivated mussels, they really worked hard to be able to get as natural an environment as possible with these new rope growing cultivations. Right, right. Now, um, with the the wild meats, uh, at least in your area, is there any particular precautions uh, that people should uh, take? Um, should they, you know, get them tested? You know, is, it, is there any, because it, I'd like to There's think that always... these animals are, you know, intuitive about what they eat, right? They, they know, like I have goats and my goats know when something is going to make them feel sick or something's going to, they just smell it and they're like, mm, I'm not sure about that, right? Nope. Yep. Same thing with my cat. So I just got a moose here and it wouldn't, because Edgar loves moose liver. However, if it's not bright, I mean, because I called my brother because it, it ended up being the guy that got it for me. He took it right from the moose and put it in a cooler. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it didn't allow it to naturally decrease in temperature. Okay. It, and so it actually be, made it mealy. I mean, it was oh. fine. For, you know, some animals would be eating it like my, my, my stepdaughter's dog loves it, but my cat wouldn't. Right. And so I, I know I was testing it because I'm, at, I'm making a moose, um, a fogwa, F-A-U-X. Oh, okay. So in, instead of, you know, fogwa, like forced duck, I make it with uh, moose liver, which is really yummy. Mm. So, you know, it's all, and the color didn't look right to me. So, you know, once you've handled game meat and organs for a while, then, you know, it's going to, you'll, you'll know, but just to get, that was a little segue to get back to your question. So a lot of people will not in areas that are more populated may not even test eating the organs just because they don't know of what could be in the ground or what's on the pesticides and things like that, right. what they're eating. If it's, you know, close to more people, um, but, you know, I'm all, 
I understand, you know, the colors and how it is. And so I, you know, I will, depending upon where it is, I will take it and eat it or use it for something. Right. Right. Yeah. But there's, it, it is, it is important to know where it came from also. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, here in Hawaii, we have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of wild animals, um, particularly uh, boar or, or pig uh, and goats and sheep. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, now I'm not a hundred percent. I've only heard this from one person, but this person seems to know a lot of people, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, one of the not so nice uh, things about paradise is that um, there's a lot of people who practice cockfighting. What they often do is they uh, will drug them up to fight. So they're more adrenaline. Right. They're more aggressive and so on. And mm -hmm. then, you know, afterwards, they just throw them out in the wild. And supposedly some of the wild pigs get at them. Oh. So, you know, they say that you should test the meat. So far, I know some people who eat local wild meat and they've gotten it tested and they've never had any problem. Uh, many of them say that you can actually smell, you know, when they've gotten into something nasty, like drugs, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I asked that question, because I just wondered if there were other contaminants or, or weird, you know, local practices that you've heard about in other parts of the country that may impact, um, you know, the, the quality of meat. If there are certain, I mean, people know within the wildlife community, if there is something going through, yeah. like when I was working out in the woods one year, we had, uh, the, the brain disease for the moose and the deer where they were eating feces and it was, the worms were getting up to the brain and they were just running around going crazy. It was just, it was like terrible. Like a scrapey? A scrapey. I'm not familiar with that term. Yeah. Scrapey is sort of like mad cow, but. Yes. But yes. But in in usually it's the uh deer they talk about it and Yes. Some of the so animals. this was a moose. I actually had to they had to put it down and I had to move it with my bucket loader. You know, but that was those then you have to be careful because this was in the middle of summer and so then you know you, the uh biologists would come to the tagging station and they would assess the animal and you know, that's always been very helpful. Right. But the uh, but the first moose that I got, I mean, it looked very healthy. And we went home, you know, because as a celebratory dinner, we usually eat the heart. Well, mm -hmm. it was riddled with worms. Yikes. So th yes. So this six year old young, huge male, which had already it already it, it was 850 pounds, it already lost 20 percent of its weight because it was near the end of Breton season. Mm -hmm. So it would not have survived the winter with its heart like that. So, oh, you know, yeah. I mean, I actually felt good because I love when an animal is presented to me that I can take because otherwise it really would have suffered. Right. Right. So that's that's another aspect yeah. of Hunting. Yeah, and you know, there's there's actually a theory on Screepy as well um, that, or, or in Mad Cow and every permutation of that, um, that it, it has a lot to do with high manganese levels. And one of the things that was found uh, in the Southwest, I want to say around Colorado, when they had their big outbreak of, I don't know, 20 years ago, uh, was that the salt licks they were the hunters were putting out to attract the deer was was imbalanced in its chemical composition and that. and you know because they're not putting like now like our goats have a Himalayan salt block that they can lick and you know I put seawater every once in a while in their water um, to get you know the the actual naturally occurring balance of minerals. Uh, but I guess like there's one that you say Morton salt puts out or some other, you know, now they're going to come after me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> you know, just, just your run of the mill, you know, not, not naturally procured, uh, salt, um, you know, that, that might have some, some bearing on some of some, well, maybe not the worms, uh, in the heart, but, uh, but for sure, you know, some of the, the mental imbalances that sometimes happen in these animals. Yeah, and part of what my, you know, my brother who is a wild game hunter and a main guide, you know, he always is trying to get people not to feed the wild animals yes. 
especially me, (laughs) because we live on a lake where we have a nesting area for geese and ducks. And so I have to help the little ducklings in the spring. (laughs) That's another whole story, you know, but it's important to call, you know, are they getting the balance of food that they need? Right. So you have to be careful. With well, that. and I think what you're saying is so important. And I mean, it all, whether you're getting it from the wild or from your local butcher or supermarket, or whatever, know the people who are handling your food. You right. Know, that, that always go. I mean, even the fact that I was able to engage in a conversation with the guy selling me the salmon saying, no, this stuff, you know, they fed it, die. This fish <laughs> was, <laughs> was fed, die. Uh, but you know, once you establish that relationship, you're more more apt to get those honest answers about yes. things. So, and you it's know. very important. You know, people are it's it, if you don't ask where your food came from, so well, then you don't care. <laughs> it's, it's your responsibility at the other end. I think. Yes, totally, totally. So, um, what are some of the 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 ver- uh, varieties, you know, the v- variability from one season to the next or one year to the next, like what, why doesn't it always taste exactly the same? I mean, we know that it's wild, but you know, are there you know, things like, let's say a drought year, how is that going to impact? Uh, it will impact uh, the hydration of the animal and what they're able to eat and absorb because then they won't be able to eat some of the drier foods that they normally would. So that balance, that's actually a great example of why meat changes because when there is a drought, you know, the fresh green leaves that's typical in abundance right. will not be there. And so the meat will change because they're eating more dried buds and bark, yeah. uh, cambium, things like that, that, would change would make the meat not nuttier but it might be it might make it a little bit wilder than if they were eating more of the greens right gotcha gotcha you know so one of the things that's interesting is that i was talking to somebody about this recently because they say well how really how does the beaver how does it taste if it just eats wood and i said well actually it doesn't eat wood (laughs) it you know, it eats the tree bark and all the soft tissue. So that cambium layer that's beneath the bark, yeah, um, on the very young trees especially, it's very tender, and that's what they love. I mean, if you see, I mean, you see some trees, really big trees that are knocked down by a beaver, like on my Facebook page, my nephew has his head stuck underneath one. But that typically, a tree like that big will be made, knocked down to hold water in to an area. But it's the small trees and the saplings of the the willows and the beeches and the birches that they're going to be taking down for their food for the winter uh, to build up their house a little bit. I mean, one of the things that people understand is that the beaver, uh, they're built, the, the huts are built way down in the water. And that's really protection from, you know, predators and people. Right. So they're only their biggest predator is probably wolves, which we don't really have any in the U.S., but people are um, a big predator. Yeah. And yeah, we learned that that lesson going on a whale watch here um, that, uh, you know, as much as like we um, uh, Americans, humans forget that we are predators and that we are a threat to a lot of wildlife. Mm -hmm. So while we may not be actively trying to let's say you know eat them let's you know raising them or or shooting them all for food we're definitely encroaching on their habitat yes and um that's reducing their numbers because now they don't have as many places or they're just showing up you know this is what's going on with coyotes now they're just showing up in the cities (laughs) i know they have nowhere to go um how did we um how did we get to a place where we no longer really appreciate, you know, like basically talking beaver, squirrel, caribou, you know, for, well, maybe not in Canada, but (laughs) in here, um, all of these, these wild game meats are, they're an anomaly. They're kind of, they're not part of the regular table. You have to know someone who knows someone to to, get them, to get, to get them. Right. You know, how did, how did that come about? When did we make that shift where we were like, oh, only going to eat these farm animals? Again, you know, part of it was the growth 
explosive growth in population. Mm -hmm. And the more we work, the less we have time to hunt. Yeah. And I know we are looking at statistics for the uh, inland wildlife and the number of young girls and boys coming into the hunting experience um, has some diminished years. However, this past year seemed to have gone up a little bit. So the more people that take the time that want to hunt and get their food or that has been in the culture in your generations, that I still see happening. Okay. But if it hasn't been in the culture of your, if you're, you know, it's through the generations or you've grown up um, in the suburbs and then got off to college and you're always in the city, you know, those things are furthest from your mind. And then you look at the convenience and the convenience is the grocery store. Right. And so we are, you know, I don't know what the balance number is right now, but I still see a, num a lot of people that are involved in the hunting and the fishing. And yet I also see a lot of people that aren't even interested because of, you know, I really think technology has moved us in the direction of more convenience. You know, oh, yeah. you want everything immediate gratification, more convenience. Let's have it now. And so, you know, if they're, edu if the people are educated enough though, cause I do know a lot of people that are like that. However, they, you know, what's important is they keep, shopping the farmer's market. They put a little planter outside just to have some herbs to add into their, you know, into their food. Uh, that little bit will just the parsley, like you talked about, if they have a little thing of parsley and they start adding it into salads, you know, they're going to say, Oh my God, I wonder what else I could do. And what? so that is a snowball effect. And mm -hmm. so if people get those ideas that you just talked about in their head, then they get excited because also when they're serving it to somebody else, somebody else says, oh, my God, what did you do? This tastes so good. I can't make it this good. And it's as simple as adding a fresh herb or something at the end. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I love what you say about people who have these traditions in their families and kind of uh, uh, holding on to that and, and moving that forward or at least, you know, keeping it for future generations and, and still um, exploring, you know, the snake and <laughs> beaver and, and other uh, meats that we don't think of. Like most of us don't even, th we look at a squirrel or a beaver and we're like, well, I'm not, you know, like the last thing we're thinking about is like eating it unless we're starving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so many people would rather reach for a bag of Doritos. Um, than to eat that. Uh, but it, it, it drives home something that uh, one of my followers has uh, told me because her husband is a psychologist and um, he, or I should say psychotherapist, and he works with uh, a lot of people who have, you know, cult-like um, affiliations. And one of the things he said is that when a, a cult, one of the first things they will do to kind of bring you over to their side is to separate you from your native foods and the foods that you enjoy with your family. And they'll prescribe a diet that basically makes you become antisocial. Interesting. And it's it's a really, uh, it, it's I think that's a really powerful um, way of interpreting it. And it's it's very true. If you look at, you know, what we would consider some of the, uh, whether it's more radical diets or radical religious practices, there's always something that's off the table that makes you not able to sit down with other people who right. are part of that group, right? Yes. Oh, um, interesting perspective. Yeah. So, you know, I like to hear that there's people like that because that's the thing is I grew up in New York City. Uh, I moved here only four years ago, but, uh, to me growing up when I would hear about people who ate these different meats and it always seemed like these people were the fringes of society, but that's because of my New York city upbringing, uh. you know, in places, you know, even, even an hour outside of New York already, you're starting to see, you know, different landscapes, different, I mean, even the way they make a pizza is different for crying out loud. Yes. So, so, you know, you can only imagine what some of those other little like local things that might uh, still be lurking, especially going into like the Native American communities and things. 
Yeah, well, it actually totally makes sense because you are not subject to hunting or wild game while you're in New York City. No, although my parents did once buy a live chicken at a market. And, and, and somebody, I don't know who slaughtered it, but I remember picking up the chicken. <laughs> it was like, it was like one of those like deals in the Bronx. Like they had this big, like open market. This is back in the seventies though. They, I don't think they allow that anymore. <laughs> no. Oh my God. But that's as good as it gets back then. Right. The fresh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, well, because, I, I, you know, and that's that's actually another really interesting thing is that uh, we going into flavors and how different it is. My family's from Jamaica and so many like for both of my parents, it took them a couple of years before they would eat American chicken. But many of, of our Jamaican relatives, they're like, we ate chicken all the time when we were in Jamaica, came to the U.S., can't stand the stuff because of what they eat. Right. It's not wild. They're not, I mean, yeah. your chickens in Jamaica, plus that's the first time I had goat was there and I've just been, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I made goat for my, for my 72 year old neighbor uh, a couple of years ago. And she was like, you could cook goat for me anytime. She had never had goat either. And she was just, she thought I was off my rocker when I told her that I was oh. making goat for dinner that one night. And she, she had like three helpings. I was like, so much for, for, uh, you know, the elderly not having a good appetite. I'm like just make right. it taste or, good. Or not having their game on and be able to try something new. Uh, you, I, I saw what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You caught that. <laughs> Yeah, she also uh, laughed at me for making a pie crust from scratch until she tasted the pie and then had two or three helpings of that as well. <laughs> so. I know. See, it, but it makes a difference, everything from scratch. And you know what? If you go through my cookbook, 50 Ways to Eat a Beaver, there are some very simple recipes. I mean, you can substitute any red meat in there, but it's just a matter of having, you know, you. I have a lot with dried because a lot of people don't have a lot of fresh herbs in there. But, you know, it's all what you like and what you're going to add into the recipe to make it yours, you know, to enjoy. Right. Yeah. And I, th I think, you know, I'm not criticizing your title by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I think, um, you know, like you said, people buy our books because of the titles. Um, and I guess I, I get this a little bit where people are like, well, I don't have a cock. All I have is a hen. Um, but you know, with beaver, I think it's important for people, for your book in particular to realize that, okay, maybe you can't get beaver, but there's so many things that you can substitute. Right. And I think, Any you know, for, especially for those of us who aren't in a, a beaver area, mm -hmm. you know, a, a beaver, bountiful beaver area <laughs> um, that we, you know, need to keep in mind that all these other red meats will work and, and even white meats, right? Like pork yeah. is not necessarily a red meat. No, it's more, it's more of a white meat. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you, cause it would actually pork would end up being too dry unless you're doing the shanks or the knuckles. I mean, then you could use some of the beaver recipes, but gotcha. pretty much red meat. Gotcha. 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 Awesome. So uh, tell us a little bit about, you were on Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmern. Yes, I was. It was so interesting. So this, uh, these friends of ours who have a Rabelais in uh, Maine, who have a rare cookbook store, uh, he had gone, Andrew had gone to school with uh, Samantha, the owner, one of the owners, and he was doing a he was doing a whole segment in Maine surrounding his father's surprise 80th birthday party. Aww. So he was trying to figure out things that he hadn't eaten before. And so she said, you've got to meet Kate. She'll eat anything. So, <laughs> so he, I guess so they called up and he had not had beaver before. Which is surprising. I know. That and the had, fact that he doesn't like nuts. It looks like walnuts or something really, <laughs> really yeah. innocuous like that. <laughs> No, that and what did he? Oh, yeah, the thousand year buried eggs, he said, or whatever right. it is. He goes, yes. he doesn't like them. But so he we, he did this whole tour of like part of down east and southern Maine. And he had come up and we were looking at places to film. We ended up building a bean hole bean pit um, in two days because wow. we did bean hole beans and then we it's we used some of my moose. I'd gotten a moose. So we had moose steak and then we had the, I did a campfire beaver chili 
which allows you to, because we cooked on the campfire too. Right. Okay. Um, right next to the beehole bee pit. And all, you know, the, the chili that I made was basically all these yummy herbs and onions and beaver. And that was it. Mm. And then I made, I don't know if you're familiar with black flies in Maine, but they are horrendous in the summer. They eat us. It's oh like my our, gosh. Like- you know, I went, I went hiking in the woods in Canada in the summer once it was like that scene from King Kong with like those giant bugs, bugs. <laughs> like oh, wrestling no. them to the ground. Oh my gosh, they were horrible. They are, yeah, they are, and they just get at your neck. And so I actually caught a bunch of black flies with this mosquito eater, so they were still alive. And so I was able to make some muffins with them, but they're so tiny, so they cooked up. And he goes, "Well, I can't use them. I can't see them." And I was like, oh, "Okay." So I did have black fly muffins, also with the real black, black flies. Black fly muffins. Yeah, but did, but it, did it, it taste like blueberries? Like, <laughs> no, there's no taste on the black flies. They just cook up to absolutely nothing. They're just, but, they're, they're just protein. Yes, little lots of protein. Okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but it was it was great working with him. You know, he was a he was really funny and you know very eloquent and right on. And it was just you know being able to talk about you know a meat that is dear to my heart because it's so good. That's awesome. Yeah, so that, he enjoyed it. It was fun. Oh, that's fantastic! It's it's great. Um, I mean, obviously great publicity, but, you know, it's, it's great to be able to share that with like a wide audience like that because he has uh, and to demystify um, yes. this 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 thing we call beaver. Mm-hmm. Um, Did so, you know that that's the second that once they're out of caribou in Canada, the next meet they go to is beaver? I could see that. I have I have this um, cookbook that I bought in Montreal. Uh, years ago and it's like because I collect grandma recipes you know I want to know what grandmas did and how they got through things and yeah the castor or beaver is features a lot in that book (laughs) there's a a lot of um, not only the meats that we don't think of as as meat or or food uh, Mm -hmm. in in as modern people but um many different kinds of berries and, and uh, they use a lot of uh, buckwheat up there. Uh, so it w- it's a really interesting book from that standpoint, because it's not one that's trying to, I think in American cookbooks, very often we start to, we get uh, into a trap of substituting the original ingredients for whatever bottled um what's readily available is right exactly uh the 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 readily available but i like the fact that this one just goes really to the heart of it and they just she just sticks to the person who wrote it sticks to these old recipes the way they were originally compiled as far as i can tell you know just just no no mention of anything um that's necessarily easier to get today than it was 100 years ago yeah that's good. I like some of the older cookbooks and how they go, except that a lot that I've seen also have been, you know, more bland or they use the same thing through all the different recipes. However, how they prepare it and add different things in to thicken it was also interesting. Right, right. Well, I think that particular cookbook, one of the things that I found interesting, and I saw this a little bit in your book as well, is some of what we normally think of as sweet spices being used in uh, savory dishes. Uh, so, you know, more of the, the cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice uh, cloves being used in, like you say, a pork dish or a beaver dish, for example. Right. Or or the you know, the cardamom with the curry. Right. Exactly. Which you, you would probably understand. I mean, all the different curries there are from around the world, which have different spices in them. You know, either they could go from having cinnamon and hot peppers to right. having just turmeric and, well. Ginger. <laughs> ginger, thank you. <laughs> I was like, what is that favorite thing I, dr- I eat all the time? I eat everything. My husband calls me ginger sometime. I put it in almost everything. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I've, I was trying to explain to a friend of mine who's a Pennsylvania Dutch 
and you know lives in rural pennsylvania she's like so she's she said oh curry I, i've never had that what's it like and i said well think of curry as like barbecue it's not just one thing there's like all kinds of barbecue and the same thing with curry like curry is more of like a name for a stew it's not a set combination of ingredients so you know approaching it from that perspective it really opens up uh, you know whole world for people who say like i don't like curry Right. It also confuses people like, what do you mean? It's like barbecue sauce. Well, you know, all the different right. layers and, you know, but then they have to leave it to us who are chefs or yeah. cooks. Right. Cooks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, so what is, um, is, sorry, first of all, before I get into that, is there anything else that you would like to add to our conversation today before I let you go? <gasps> oh, well, I think we have pretty much gone through everything that I wanted to talk about that's important. Um, I just want, you know, people are always asking me, and I think it's very important to understand that you just, you can't buy beaver. You, I mean, I would suggest people to ask either their local, local game warden, or if they know someone that traps, or even a wild game butcher, because right. they all they know a lot of people that do catch and relief with the an, release with animals, mm. and if they do, then the butcher could be the person to actually take care of the animal for them. So it's important that if you don't have access to it and you would like to, that there are resources out there. Yeah, and that's that's a, a big uh, thing here where we encourage people to just start talking to the people who are the purveyors of food in your area. You'd be surprised what you find when you just, you know, peel back the curtain a little bit. So, so many people do not fully understand where they live until they start trying to improve their health and eating a little bit closer to nature. Uh, then they suddenly uncover, like they notice signs that they didn't notice, whether it's for, you know, somebody who has a cart, a, a cooler of eggs <laughs> sitting out on their lawn every day or, right. um, or yeah, these little butchers. I know in, uh, Canada, again, in, in, uh, the Charlevoix area of Canada, of Quebec, uh, there is, or there, at least there was, uh, last time I went several places that specialized in uh emu meat for example and just mm. like these local really you know um really just just uh wild well the emu was not necessarily wild <laughs> they, they were farmed farm raised uh, farm however raised. but it's a, it's a new source of protein that right. somebody hasn't tried right exactly and, and yeah, we they, have go on Go ahead. I was going to say, we have the same in, so in Maine, we have these halal markets mm. because of the influx of different uh, immigrants coming over, you know, and, and that's where I get fresh lamb, fresh goat. And right. unfortunately it's not fresh, but I, I have been able to get camel from them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, it's really, so just, and the farmer's market, I cannot stress that enough for people. You know, it's such an amazing source. And if you don't see something that you want, ask. Because Absolutely. there are a lot of people that don't participate in farmer's market because they don't have the time. However, they do have the source. Absolutely. Um, how, uh, I mean, you seem to, you know, have the hookup on Beaver. Uh, <laughs> or if you, you've got, <laughs> you've got, uh, is it your brother and a good friend who, who yes. catch for you? Uh, yeah. so yeah, so you, you've got your, your hookup, but if somebody were to purchase beaver about how much a pound are they looking at or, or you just buy them by the animal? What's, what's the deal? No, with? you can't sell it. They, oh, so they're just not allowed to sell. It's illegal. It's illegal. Okay. Completely. It's illegal to sell. Gotcha. However, you can, you know, like I will trade a cookbook for a beaver or some meat for somebody because you know, they're getting something that they want and I get what I want. Right. Okay. So bartering is still uh, uh, allowed uh, yeah. until now. Awesome. Well, that's until somebody hears this and it's illegal and then I come after me. No. Oh, okay. We'll just block that out. Okay. <laughs> we no, didn't say anything here. It's fine. Okay. I don't... <laughs> I've been trying to get on a python hunt for the last couple of years. Whoa. Yeah, so for, I mean, talk about something great for my birthday. My husband a few years ago had, 
gone, got found this place in Nevada with all this wild game meat. So he got me all this wild game meat for my birthday. You know, I had python, I had iguana, I had llama tongue, I had, oh, I can't even tell you what else. It was just, it was amazing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and my friends are like, only you would be excited about this stuff. I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I mean, it's a little hardcore even for me, but <laughs> but oh, I can no, see, no. I can understand it. I can totally, I totally get. It. I mean, I would like to. That's the thing is, like a lot of stuff, I'd like to try a bite first, you know. <laughs> yeah, just even a little bit. I mean, I tried to get these people to let me try some armadillo when I was in Belize. Oh, yeah. But you well, know that's... what? But you know what? They're respectful, and this is what I liked is that. So the iguanas and the armadillos were in the fertilization season. Okay. So they would not kill them because they couldn't tell which one the males and the females, you know, were at the time, I guess. Or at least that's what they told me. And so they were just respecting, you know, their uh, birthing rights. So I'm like, oh, I understand that. I'll come back when they're when they're done. (laughs) (laughs) Just take your mother away from you. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. But that is that is uh, incredible. Well, I hope that people listening to this, you know, will, uh, will go and investigate, you know, see what's available in their area. You know, we don't have to starve. And see, now I'm just opening a whole other can of worms because, uh, you know, there's so many of these articles going around especially these places in like spain and san francisco that are saying we're not going to have enough meat eat this plant that we're putting into a vial somewhere and a guy in a lab coat is going to turn it into protein for you (laughs) synthetic synthetic Mm, synthetic yeah and and, and they make it sound natural right oh it's got algae it's just algae grown in a petri dish (laughs) oh god knows what else is going on in there Oh, please. Visuals. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, so, yeah, you know, I've, I've, unless you've watched the uh, the show Last Man on Earth, uh, <laughs> there's no chance um, of really, you know, every one of these wild meats just becoming extinct. I think we just need to uh, start appreciating them more. You know, I don't think yes. the, I don't think the issue is that there's not enough food. Uh, I, I say this repeatedly on the show that there's it's not an issue of whether or not there's enough food to feed the seven billion or the nine billion that we're expecting in 40 years. Uh, but it's more of let's not waste and let's look at other sources that are around us. And, and in this case, rediscover the foods of our ancestors. Right. You know, our all of our greens and other kind of proteins, you know, the beans, the lagoons right. are all very healthy and a great complement to the diet. Right. Well, you know, in, in my lexicon, I, I consider the beans and the nuts, uh, well, beans, starch and nuts fat. Uh, I do think that they, they can support proteins, but I don't, I, I don't like to see it when people rely on them as a protein source, because I've just seen too many disasters, <laughs> even though we've had a few, a few guests who say, no, 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 we found a way to make it work. Uh, but it just seems like it's a little bit playing Russian roulette when people, try to uh uh rely on those exclusively right it's hard you know i you see all the iron deficiencies and things like well that. i mean there's more than just iron yeah there's a there's a lot of deficiencies and and when you look again historically at how people have eaten these foods it's always with an animal food you know there's always some you know little piece of pork in there or some fish broth or uh you know some some animal food or dairy protein uh right exactly mm-hmm so, um, you know, just keeping that in mind. So uh, with that said, can you tell me your, I know that your website is blackflystew.com. Do you have a, yes. face, you have a Facebook page as well? Uh, yes. It, it, if you just actually type my name in, Kate Krakowski Gooding, that will come up. Okay, great. And your books can be purchased at, uh, on amazon.com as well as islandportpress.com. Right. If you go to my website, actually, I do. I have the links are there to provide unless they want hand autographed and then they just send me an email. Awesome. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, Kate, thank you so much for spending time with us and for educating us on um, this fabulous meat called beaver. And thank you very much for having me, Adrian. Oh, but of course. And folks, uh, you don't want to miss recipes like mustard crusted beaver. Mm. And porcini rubbed beaver. 
Mm. And the notorious <laughs> beaver loins. The best. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, let us know when you're when you have a new book coming out. I will. Thank you, Adrian. Fantastic. Thanks. Bye. Bye. The Nutrition Heretic Podcast is a production of Savor the Journey, LLC. Our audio editor is Nikola Popovich. Our podcast manager is Crystal McLean. And our operations manager is Michelle Med. I'm your host, Adrian Hugh, the Nutrition Heretic. You can find us at the new and improved nutritionheretic.com, where you can download the Nutrition Heretic's free shit list of seven health foods to avoid like the plague. You can also listen to previous episodes at nutritionheretic.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to like us on social media for updates. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash nutritionheretic and on Twitter at NutriHeretic. Contact us with show ideas, questions, or if you want to be a guest. And don't forget to rate our podcast on iTunes and Stitcher.